Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the latest of the Greens List morning seminars. Pain in the common law, an update. I think if I'd been writing the heading, I would have made it something racier, starting with the law as an ass and working from there. And uh, getting up in the morning at 7.15 can be a pain. But you'll be rewarded today because we've got two eminently qualified speakers to bring you up to date on pain and the law. Um, the first speaker is Rod McNeil. Um, I think you've got a handout of his, uh, uh, from his uh, web page. And uh, Rod has uh, a unique background for a practicing barrister. He's a medically, medically, a legally qualified medical practitioner who practiced as a doctor for seven years. He's been a partner in a major international firm. He's been a senior corporate lawyer in a public company and uh, has had extensive experience in commercial litigation as well as common law. He uh, hasn't been at the bar very long, but he's practised uh, both in um, trial work and in mediations. And um, he will talk this morning concentrating on the way pain is treated in, uh, uh, in, in the definitions of pain by the courts and the appreciation of pain by the courts, bringing to bear his medical skills. I'm sure you'll be better informed as you listen to him and the pain of getting up early in the morning will gradually ease. Could you, in, could you welcome Rod McNeil, please? Thanks, Dave. I have mixed emotions about this room because it's less than 12 months that I was sitting in here as a reader. So, uh, okay. But as part of my extensive research for today's presentation, I had back, a look back through the history of pain and basically discovered that Homo sapiens as such has been around for 100,000 years. And then there was a great leap forward about 50,000 years ago when tools were discovered. So the work cover lawyers in the room will immediately get interested at the prospect of people working because, of course, they would have injured themselves. Accidents would have happened back in the caves, etc. And I'm sure there was chronic back pain. I know that because they've dug up some old skeletons and they've actually found evidence of osteoarthritis and spondylosis, terms that are dear to most of the lawyers in this room. So I asked myself, when was the first evidence of homo litigans, your forefathers? And uh, I don't yet have the answer to that. In relation to the law, of course, the Hammurabi Code was around something like 3,000 years ago. Roman law, 2,000 years ago. English common law, depending on your definition and the particular statute, something like the 11th, 12th or 13th century onwards and the statutory compensation system, which many of us have come to love and deal with every day now, has been around for in excess of 20 <laughs> years. So my question is, how come President Maxwell last year, with 100,000 years of history of pain and several thousand years of law and maybe 1,000 years of common law and 20 plus years of the statutory system, used the words something as unquantifiable as pain. Does the President of the Court of Appeal have some concerns about this? And then he went on to say in Hayden, he asked both sides, could they look at the precedents and come back to him and give him some assistance? And he said, well, both sides responded that the case law was of little or no assistance, since each case was different from every other case. As you all know, very well, Mr Justice Buchanan went on and said, pain is not objectively measurable. <clears throat> Experience of and reaction to pain varies from one person to another. Mr Justice Nettle talked about principle and the assessment of pain and suffering consequences, whether they're sufficient to qualify an injury as serious is a question of fact, degree and value judgment in the determination of which comparisons with other cases and checklists of relevant considerations are at best of limited utility. Now, I won't go into Sutton and Laminex, etc., but I'm simply pointing out, as I like to point out 
now that I'm running my own serious injury applications to the judges, that there's no clear answers on this. So my question to start off with is, what is pain? Now, it's probably pertinent to do a little bit of more detailed self-introduction. I always say to people in these talks, my first slide usually, who is this bloke and why should we listen to anything that he has to say? And I say, well, that's a very good question and never forget it. Then when I do talk and I introduce myself, it's up to you as to whether or not you want to take away anything from what I say or whether you want to think about tonight's dinner or whatever. But I have practised law for something in excess of 25 years, both as uh, a corporate partner, an M&A partner. I was in-house for 12 years. And tomorrow week is my first anniversary of being a barrister. Dave may or may not remember back in February when he took me up to the county court for the very first time and I was falling over my paraphernalia, my penguin costume, and he politely didn't point out what a terrible job I've done of the chronology. Um, and I've come a little way since then and uh, I'm reasonably chuffed to say that I had my first success as a solo in a judgement handed down earlier this week and I'm now being briefed uh, with my own juniors. And I'll come back to that because it has surprised me. And I've wondered, gee, how come I'm doing OK as a barrister? And I'll come back and talk to some of those aspects um, later. But I've also been involved in medicine for 13 years. Um, both student, doctor, I've practised in America, I've practised in Hong Kong for four years, I've practised in trauma centres. And for my sins, I now work every Saturday in the emergency room at Casey Hospital. So if out Berwick way on a Saturday and you get some abdo pain or something, you may or may not see my smiling face. Um, and after all that, what I've learned is three things. One, pain is really complicated and it's not fully understood. Two, surprisingly, it is constantly developing. And three, when you think about it, all pain is, is a series of chemical reactions in the body. Now let me give you some examples of that. There's an august body of people, of all the pain specialists in the world, and every year they hold a meeting called the World Congress of Pain. And you get hundreds of pain specialists from all around the world, and the very first item on the agenda every year is what? What is pain? So these guys still don't know what it is. And then when you read the papers, which I've started to do, because I've started to get interested in this, they're examining some of the most basic concepts about what pain actually is. And the reason this is relevant to medical to legal practitioners is when you get in preparing your papers and when you get into courts and you get an almost ignorant understanding by either the practitioners, the solicitors, the judges or the juries of concepts that the top people in the world don't understand, there's a mismatch going on. And I think that society and the legal system is ill-served if that mismatch is uh, fed. A few weeks ago I had a lass come in and she said, I said, what's wrong? She said, I have a stabbing pain in the chest. Hand up anyone who's ever been stabbed. I haven't been stabbed, but I've treated a lot of people that have been stabbed. And usually it goes something like this. And remember, I've worked in America for a long time. Jose, you've got a stab wound. Oh shit, man, I've been stabbed <laughs> again. Because gunshot wounds and stabbings are actually a recurrent disease. And surprisingly, stab wounds don't actually hurt most people. Bang. Not always, but often bang. Oh God, there's one there, there's one there. So actually, describing something as a stabbing pain actually doesn't convey much information. And yet, when I first said that to you, I'm sure you formed an impression of what I was trying to get to. Why is he going on about this? Think of another situation where someone is sitting there listening to someone describing the pain that they're suffering. Let's call that person, just for the sake of it, a judge. In other instances, you might get a couple of people sitting there trying to understand, because they haven't experienced the pain, but on the basis of the objective evidence before them, and if there's more than one, well, we could call them the Court of Appeal. We could call them a jury. Starting to see the 
cross over. Doc, I've got pain in my tummy. It's like a rat is gnawing at my guts. I wish I had a dollar for the number of times someone said that to me in an emergency room. The one that does seem to strike home, and once again has never <coughs> happened, is when someone says, it's a pain as if an elephant is standing on my chest. Now that always gets every doctor's attention for one simple reason. Why? Ischemic heart disease, heart attack, bang. Wonderfully off to cath labs these days. So all you ever do as a doctor is inquire about pain, but you can never understand it. So you are relying on the subjective description of pain to try to make a medical diagnosis. You then often consult with your colleagues, either a senior doctor or a specialist, and what I do on Saturdays, I'll see someone, I'll then either go and talk to the fellow, the emergency medicine fellow, or I'll call a specialist in the Monash system. Pretty much the first question after they ask for vital signs is describe the pain. It's really interesting. Tell me about the pain, Rod. If it's someone who's got chest pain, the description of the pain over that couple of hours beforehand is, is incredibly important from a diagnostic point of view. So as a doctor, I am now conveying the pain description to a third party. Once again, is any of this sounding familiar? I may then go back to the patient and I'll ask them more about the pain. I spend a lot of time talking to them about the pain. And one of the things I've come to realise, I've actually been cross-examining patients for 13 years. I've just, I, I just, how come I can do this? I'd go home and say to my wife, how come I can actually cross-examine people? I'm a corporate lawyer until February this year. How come I can get a psychiatrist in the box or a GP in the box and talk to them for an hour, hour and a half, two hours? Because it's not that far from what I've been doing as a doctor. And that's assisted me as I've tried to understand uh, from the barrister point of view and from the legal point of view, this whole equation between pain and the common law. I like to put it like this. As a doctor, I'm trying to make a medical diagnosis based on the subjective evidence of the patient and the objective evidence given to me by such things as blood tests, ECGs, etc., chest X-rays, CTs, MRIs, etc. As a judge, they are trying to make a judicial diagnosis on the basis of the subjective evidence of the plaintiff in the form of the affidavits that you guys will often be preparing in response to the viva voce evidence given in court with the benefit of the assistance of both counsel. Similarly, a jury will be in a position where they're being asked to make a factual diagnosis based on the evidence that's placed in front of them. Once again, some subjective evidence has relayed to them within the laws of evidence and the court rules, etc., and the statutory provisions. And so the two fields actually are a lot more similar than I personally had ever realised. People like to ask me about it. And at first I struggled to answer because to me, as a corporate lawyer, I had absolutely nothing to do with medicine for 20 years. This year has been just fascinating for me, quite challenging. One of the things I've come to realise is in the medical system, you have almost one group of people trying to work together in an open dialogue to reach the correct outcome, namely a correct diagnosis. If you translate this into a legal type scenario, it's more of the inquisitorial type of system. The legal system, rightly or wrongly, depends upon a different view, namely that the best outcome in a particular case, and generally for society, is by adversarial system, where both sides are trying hammer and tong to represent, and somewhere, maybe at one extreme, maybe at the other, you get the best outcome and the most correct judicial diagnosis or factual diagnosis by the jury. So I, I find that quite interesting that society has developed almost two quite different systems in medicine and law trying to reach the correct outcome. But I think it's actually even more interesting than that because I think that in a healthy 
medical environment, there's more adversarial or quasi-adversarial discussion taking place with people challenging each other, etc. And we have things called M&Ms, which are morbidity and mortality, where it's just an open free-for-all where people attack other doctors' diagnoses, etc., but not in a not in a negative way, in a how can we all learn from this. And if the rules of court are followed, both for counsel and for solicitors, then in many ways the adversarial system has many common grounds that, that do get the parties more together so that you're not arguing about the petty stuff. I think that's in the best system and you're actually trying to get the, assist the judge or the jury to get to the most correct um, uh, diagnosis, judicial or otherwise. But let's go back to pain. I can give you a one minute physiology lesson and that will probably exhaust my physiological knowledge. I can talk about nociceptors, which are the pain fibres, and this is about all I remembered from med school. There were pain fibres, if you cut them it hurt. These can be cutaneous on the skin, you cut your skin it hurts. These can be deep. Uh, can be visceral pain. Anyone that's had gallbladder disease or kidney stones or anything knows that visceral pain or a heart attack is actually an extraordinary, it's the number one pain of pains. Pain transmission has a completely different pathway to other forms of nerve. So when you examine a patient, you do three examinations. You do pin, prick, light touch and hurt them because there's actually different fibres, nerve fibres for each of those three. Pain goes up to the spinal cord, Spinal cord, we learn about the dorsal horn. We hear about ascending spinal pathways. We hear the, the sexy thing at the moment is this pain modulation and gait control. When I went to med school, none of this even existed. Descending inhibitory pathways is the other area that they're getting very excited about how somehow in your spinal cord, and this gets very important uh, in relation to chronic pain. Neurotransmitters, as I said, ultimately everything's just a chemical reaction. The brain, you can operate on the brain without anaesthetic, interestingly. With the gazillions of pain cells in your brain, they actually don't have any nociceptors. So when you do uh, brain surgery, uh, <laughs> My only story on that is Charlie Teo, who many of you may have heard, was the registrar at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital when I was an intern, and he did once get me to drill a hole in someone's head, which I was doing very tentatively, and Charlie leaned over my shoulder and said, push harder, Rod. And just as I did, he said, but not too hard, because you'll kill the patient. <laughs> I still remember that one. Uh, neuropathic pain. Doctors love to call things something pathic. It just means you don't know what's wrong with it. Neuro means nerve. Pathic means something's wrong with it. There's something wrong with it, the nerves and it's causing you pain. It's like idiopathic. When you really don't have a clue what's going on, I'm sorry, it's idiopathic. Ooh. We have uh, psychogenic pain. I got this. I love to cross-examine psychiatrists now. And this is a psychiatrist who many of you will know. And uh, he said this in the witness box a few months ago, pain is a very subjective area. This is a vexed problem, not just for psychiatrists, but for all medical clinicians. We do rely heavily on subjective reports of pain and the effect of such pain. The non-psychiatric medical specialists defer to psychiatrists in attempting to come up with the diagnosis and the psychiatrists refer to our non-diagnostic colleagues. I'm sure this sounds familiar to some of you. This is a very difficult area. What I call the rule of threes is that having sat through several hundred, if not thousands, of talks like this in the 13 years I went to university and the various conferences and that, study after study has shown that you guys will only retain three things at most from today. And what that is. We've got three speakers, so maybe all you'll retain from this morning is that Arish and Dave and I were here. If that's the case, so be it. Hopefully, from each of us, you'll retain three things. But it will be interesting a month from now when you think back to this morning and think, well, what did I actually learn that day? I'm going to offer three things to you. If you remember any of them, I'll be thrilled. One, pain is very difficult. I think you have a responsibility to be exhaustive and precise in how you document pain of your clients both from the plaintiff, the treating doctors and the forensic doctors. 
Number two, I think the terminology must be precise and exact. I think you owe that to the profession. Uh, I love it when someone gets something wrong in court because I can go to town. I can get the judge on side. I can just throw the spanner in the works and I can start to gain a credibility and a legitimacy for myself that if someone hadn't thrown me a free, free kick, if you like, by having sloppy drafting or whatever, that I wouldn't have had. Thirdly, I'm not sure about this one. I've put a quote from President Maxwell and I've put a quote from me, which is, I put there, is totally unsupported by anything. I just sort of made it up. Um, and President Maxwell was talking about the predictability of outcome when we're talking about this very, very difficult of area of pain. And he looked backwards. He then went on, as you know, to document a lot of the case law and see what precedents. And I agree that it's in everyone's interest to try to get some degree of con consistency, bearing in mind what Justices Buchanan and Nettle said. My view is, yes, that's all right, but looking forward, as pain and the medical science continues to improve, then the law should stay consistent with and relevant to the development of that medical science, so that there is a degree of responsibility on you guys and other practitioners in the area to stay up to date. A few quick words on physical pain and psychological pain. In TAC co cases, obviously, Richards and Wiley. As defence counsel, we go straight there. We try to convince the judge in some of those cases that it's, you know, it's all in their head. Um, in the other, the Accident Compensation Act, you've got a question of choosing which of the correct statutory heads you want to go under. In the Victorian courts, one of the things I found interesting is this use of the term organic and non-organic, which I'd never come across in all my medical practice, and I still don't. So the only time I ever come across this is in the Victorian courts. So I sort of think, and people, some of the judges really like to use it, and so I've sort of got to play the game a bit, and I think organic means um, physical and non-organic means psychological, but the divide between them isn't all that great. One of the other things I like to do when you can get into psychological pain is go to the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I like to go to 30780 and 30789 and I like to talk about whether or not the diagnostic criteria for these psychiatric illnesses are satisfied. Again, you, the setting you're in is often in the TAC cases especially, but it can be in the work cover and other cases where you have an, an accident, some degree of resolution of that, but some degree of chronicity about some type of complaint. You may or may not then get the anxiety, depression. You may or may not get psycho psychologists or psychiatric involvement, the role of antidepressants, which is the predominant cause of the plaintiff's uh, impairment, et cetera, and what is the cause that should be compensated through pain and suffering. And so uh, to the extent that you can get into this area, it's very helpful. We've got a case cooking at the moment where we spent uh, quite a lot of time um, in front of Her Honour Judge Mullane and it'll be interesting to see what she does with it all because it was fascinating, the evidence that came out in testimony. Now just to make things more interesting, DSM-5 is on its way. First thing I'll say about DSM-5 is that it's scheduled to be published in May 2013. It's currently under discussion and if you're interested just Google DSM-5 and go to the American Psychiatric Association webpage and there goes a month of your life. As you read all the discussion, it's incredible, the discussion that's going on. One of the most interesting is the act of hoarding, collecting things and not getting rid of them is being proposed as a psychiatric illness under DSM-5. So I have a psychiatrically ill daughter and I'm sure we all know under DSM-5, psychiatrically well people. So that's one of the things. One of the other things is having just talked to you about 30780 and 30789, the proposal at the present point in time is that both these diagnoses will disappear. Now I look forward 
And I was only put on my self-alert to this about two months ago when I was cross-examining a very well-read, well well well-knowledgeable GP and an extraordinary psychiatrist. And on, in the box, they talked about this and we're talking about DSM-4 and they went into DSM-5 and it was just amazing, the discussions, where they were putting us on notice that these pain disorder diagnoses were going to disappear. If I haven't put it in the materials, but if you go to that web page, let me just read to you um, what they're saying, why it's difficult. They say, because the current terminology for somatoform disorders is confusing, and because somatoform disorders, psychological factors affecting medical conditions, and factitious disorders all involve presentation of physical symptoms and or concern about medical illness, the work group suggests renaming this group of disorders somatic symptom disorders. So we're going to start hearing about somatic symptom disorders in your psychiatric reports for your chronic pain patients, plaintiffs. In addition, because of the implicit mind-body dualism and the unreliability of assessments of medically unexplained symptoms, any of this sound familiar in terms of <laughs> cross-examining pla um, plaintiffs. These symptoms are no longer emphasised as core features of many of these disorders. Since somatization disorder, hypochondria, undifferentiated somatoform disorder and pain disorders share certain common features, namely somatic symptoms and cognitive distortions, the work group is proposing that all these disorders be grouped under a common rubric called complex somatic syndrome disorder. This is going to be amazing in the chronic pain space and in the pain disorder space. You've all seen pain disorder um, diagnoses, etc., and, and they're, the, they're the real food, food of a lot of the complaints that come before us. In Peterson and the Commonwealth of Australia, the, um, Mr Justice Kay warned us that the DSM-4 is not a cookbook for amateurs. One thing that does irritate me, however, is when I read a report, often from a GP who makes a diagnosis of a major depression, sometimes other things, pain disorder, pain syndrome, etc., and then when I get them on the box and I ask them about their mental status examination, they say they never did one. It irritates me, but I love it, because that takes me to a good place in terms of knocking out their... Um, their report. The flip side for plaintiffs is if you're going to get people to write reports, the um, responsibility is on you to get it right. And if they get it wrong, you have to go back to them and get them to clarify. So this is my first note, which I've already alluded to earlier. Second paragraph, any forensic medical report should include all accurate and detailed diagnoses, background facts, etc. Now this sounds like stuff you already know, and I'm sure most of you do, but it's important, and I think it's going to get more and more important as this area gets trickier. Chronic pain. Just to go quickly, you've all seen the terminology acute pain. Persistent pain is used often because chronic pain terminology has such negative connotation. Chronic pain syndrome, there's no such thing. That psychiatrist called it an appalling diagnosis, an intellectually lazy diagnosis. It doesn't exist. Chronic pain disorder does exist under DSM-4, but will not exist under DSM-5. So where does that leave us? I don't know. Watch this space. Neuropathic pain, I've already said, doesn't really mean anything. Neurological pain simply means that something's wrong with a nerve. Complex regional pain syndrome 1 and 2. I won't spend two minutes. That's a whole series of lectures unto itself. But if you use the diagnosis complex regional pain syndrome, that takes you into a whole different world. That's a real disease. You can trace it back to the dum-dum bullets in the American Civil War. There's the 11 criteria of the American Medical Association. It's a whole legal minefield in America, whether or not you need eight, or recently in Kentucky, seven diagnostic criteria. If you Google CRPS America, you'll get thousands of pages. This is a chart um, that I've put in here, and it's, it's, it's a really interesting area. Acute pain people understand. The migration in a small number of patients to a chronic pain disorder, complaint, whatever, has been poorly understood. 
I had Professor Davis on the stand a few months ago and he just gave an hour and a half, two hours testimony how he doesn't understand it and he talked about this migration, that something is happening. And this chart sort of starts to show it in the days and weeks and months that you get these neurotransmitters, you get different feedback events occurring in some people in the spinal pathways and so this is where they're trying to understand why some people get things. The medical science is full of evidence of the fact that if you have 100 people in a plane crash and they all survive, 95% of them, 95 of them will go on and be okay. Three of them will need some sort of assistance going forward and two of them will probably commit suicide. And going in, I think it's more correct than not to say you don't know which of those two it's going to be. Now two I've already said, be careful and exact with your terminology. Finishing up, I just remind everyone, as Mr Justice Brookings said many years ago in Petkovsky and Galetti, where he talked about the present foolish, wasteful and inconvenient system, and more recently Mr Justice Nettle, where he talked about, well, if the process smacks of imprecision, impression and adjectival criteria, then it's all Parliament's fault. But we have to work in that statutory system still, every day both in the serious injury stage and in the trial stage. And so my point is that both at the serious injury stage and at the trial, notwithstanding the obvious deficiencies in the system, the law should stay up to date with, should follow the science that's continuing to develop. And I think that that statement is essentially consistent with what Mr uh, President Maxwell said. Uh, thank you very much, Rod. That's got our neurons agitated. Um, we're going to have a break now for 10 minutes. Uh, Rod's going to stick around till the end and we'll have some questions for both speakers at the end if that suits.